Well, good morning, everyone. This morning, I could have, uh, because I'm doing a, uh, a spot and not a series, I could have chosen any subject I liked to speak about. And, um, and in my deliberations, there's just one that just, that's very dear to my heart, and it's um, something I think about a fair bit. And so I've decided this morning to talk about prayer, but not just prayer for the sake of it. I'm sure you've heard plenty of messages on prayer, uh, but, but not just mediocre prayer, but powerful prayer and effective prayer is what I had on mind. Prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian's life. It should be like part of breathing for the Christian. It's the measure of a Christian life and it's directly related to a person's knowledge and understanding of God's word. Praying to God in his will with the right spirit has the potential of unlimited power in us for God to work through us to those around us. While many of us pray somewhat, my feeling is that it doesn't have the priority in our lives that it should and hence our life and the life of our church suffers because of it. One Sunday, follow, the following obituary, I can never say that right, was read at the first neglected church, and this is what it said. Mrs. Prayer Meeting died recently at the first neglected church on Worldly Avenue. She was born many years ago at a time of great revivals, and she was one of the most influential members of the church family. However, for the past several years, Mrs. Prayer had been failing in health, And uh, at the last, she was a shadow of her former self. Her last whispered words were inquiries concerning the absence of those loved ones now busy in the workplace and with worldly entertainment. Experts, including Dr. Works and Dr. Reform, disagreed as to the cause of her fatal illness. They had administered last large doses of organisations and activities, but to no avail. Only a few were present at her death. A post-mortem showed that a deficiency of spiritual food coupled with a lack of faith and general support were contributing causes to her demise. In honour of her passing, the church will now be closed on Wednesday nights. Unfortunately, that obituary could be read over many churches and over many Christians, but let us pray that such an obituary is never read at this church. God has done everything possible to incite us to pray, to excite us to pray, and to invite us to pray, but somehow it can end up becoming a lower priority in our lives. Let us pray. Lord, as we open your word, please help us to be eager to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Help us to leave our worldly concerns at the door and take away the things and thoughts that may distract us. Speak to us from your word this morning. I pray, amen. Our passage this morning is taken from Ephesians 6.18, but before we read that, I want to just give you a little context as to where the verse fits in. So if you'd open your Bibles to Ephesians 6.10, just have a, a bit of a look at that. In Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 17, Paul is exhorting the Ephesians to be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. He tells them that their struggle is not against people as much as against rulers and powers and spiritual forces of darkness in the spiritual realm. So he tells them to put on the full armour of God, that is, the girding of your loins with truth, putting on the breastplate breastplate of righteousness, put on your feet the gospel of peace, take up the shield of faith, put on the helmet of salvation and pick up the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. And the final part after that is Paul telling us to be strong in the strength of his might. We come to look at this verse this morning, verse 18, which says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit with this in view to be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. My paraphrase goes like this, pray at all times 
in all aspects of our lives and in the good times and in the bad times. By yielding to the Spirit, we're placing our desires with His, with all types of prayers and petitions. To that end, keep watchful and alert and vigilant with a strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in prayer on behalf of all God's beloved people. It's worth noting that this verse, this one verse, contains the word all four times. All prayers and petitions, at all times, being on the alert in all perseverance and on behalf of all the saints. So before we look at what prayer is, let's just have a quick look at what prayer is not. Contrary to popular belief, prayer in and of itself has no power. There is no power in prayer. People the world over, of all religions, and even non-Christians pray, but their prayers are often ineffective, well, always ineffective. Even in our own culture, non-Christians will utter prayers at times of distress. It's not the prayer that has the power, it's the person who you are praying to that has the power. And the Bible tells us there is only one triune God and he is the only one listening to prayers. And he is the only one with the ability to act on them if he so wills. Prayer is not a way of getting God to submit to your every whim or to be your personal butler. God is not Father Christmas, whose purpose is to make everyone happy all the time or to provide with you your best life now. And prayer isn't like magic either. Some people think if they say the right words in the right order, then they will get their good things. You know, just like a vending machine. Pop in some money, pray in Jesus' name, name it and claim it, recite the Lord's Prayer, and out pops the thing you wanted. Some things think that if they just say positive words and think positive things and pray with a positive attitude, their prayers are much more likely to be answered. Here's a quote from a Christian magazine I read this last week. It says, If your prayer is to regain health, yet you speak of your body as failing, you're creating a messy situation that is working against you instead of for you. We need to speak the right words. Negative, discouraging words will not bring answered prayer. Start with the right thoughts and cement the deal by speaking those thoughts out loud. Others talk about prayer... Uh, with the idea of visualizations, which comes from like the Buddhists. Here's another quote. My thoughts, my imaginations, my visualizations need to paint the picture of what my prayer consists of. If I'm looking for a job, my thoughts need to envisage myself being offered that job, accepting that job, and becoming an employee of that company. The New Ages would go further. They'd say that God is the love that upholds the universe the ocean of life and power that pervades all creation. Through scientific methods of prayer, we can attune ourselves to that infinite power and bring healing to body, mind and soul. In contrast, Jesus in Matthew 6.10 gives us an example of how we can pray in an appropriate way to be heard by God. He is saying this because at this time, some of the people he was talking to at the Sermon of the Mount were parading their righteousness before others to big note themselves. He says in verse 1, Beware of practising your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. They were giving to the poor, very publicly so, so that people could see just how generous they were and to receive the public accolade that goes with it. This behaviour is typical of a narcissist. They do good things, not because they care about the things they are doing, but because of the attention it brings themselves. The doing good is just a bit of collateral damage often. Jesus was also addressing the way they prayed. In verse 5 he says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. But truly I say to you, they have received their reward in full. Then Jesus goes on to tell him in verse 6 that they should go to an inner room, close the door 
and pray in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Prayer is not for your glory, but God's glory. Everything you pray for should have the ultimate purpose in glorifying God. And even when we pray for people and things, we pray for them so that when God answers that prayer, he is praised and worshipped because of what he has done. The Lord's Prayer starts with, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so the Lord's Prayer starts off by recognising whose God is and glorifying him. There's a story of a young man who had a sweetheart. They were so in love, they eventually married, but not long after, the husband got conscripted as a soldier to go off to war. So off he went. His wife, missing him, would bake him some biscuits, put them in a tin and post them off to him with a letter, telling him how much she loved him and missed him and was eagerly waiting for his return. So she would write every week speaking of her love and talking about the things that they'd do when he returned. After many weeks of waiting, she finally received a letter from him. It said, thanks for the food. Of course, in real life, that wouldn't be a likely response, and nor would it be the response of anyone who knows the Lord and knows his word. God has expressed and demonstrated his great love for us. And when we pray to him, we don't just say, thanks for the food but we can't help to praise him and worship him because of who he is and for what he has done. Even if the earth and mankind were never created, God would still be worthy of all praise and all glory. But as he has created us, and because he loves us, we get to share in his kingdom and experience him and his goodness. The writer of Psalm 145 says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. While he is worthy of praise because of who he is, he is also worthy of praise for what he's done. The history of Israel is a testament to the hand of God in delivering them from their enemies and blessing them with bounty. And of course we, the church, know Christ as our Saviour and Lord, worthy of the greatest praise and honour for what he has achieved in his death and resurrection. Ultimately, we were created to worship God. And so it's only proper that our prayers recognise him for what he's done. The Lord's Prayer goes on to say, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we pray God's, for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done, this is where for our prayers to have any traction with God, we need to be praying within his will. We need to be praying for things that he wants, things that ultimately glorify him. Give us this day our daily bread is where we petition God for the things that we need to live and ask him for the resources we need to be able to provide the things uh, and the needs of our families, to be hospitable, to carry out our ministry and disciple others in the church, to be able to spread the gospel to the lost and to support each other in the church. Jesus reminds us that in order for God to hear us, we need to confess our sins and make ourselves right with him. We also need to forgive others that have wronged us in the same way that God forgives us, showing the same compassion to them as God does to us. Spurgeon is quoted as saying, I never expect until I get to heaven to be able to cease confessing sin every day and every time I stand before God. And so it is with us. We need to come clean before the Lord and to ask him for anything Verse 13 says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God doesn't tempt us, but he will subject us to trials and expose us to the assaults from Satan and his demons. We should make sure we're humanly possible to flee from sin and to flee from the things that would tempt us to sin. God knows our needs and promises that he will not put us through times of testing greater than that with which we can endure. He promises to always make a way of escape. 
but how often that is through endurance. Apart from the Lord's Prayer, I think one can learn a lot about the things we need to pray for by looking at Paul's prayer. His heart is burdened for the people in the churches he cares for. In Romans 10, he is praying that the Israelites would be saved. In Romans 15, he is praying that the church in Rome would have endurance, courage and unity. And we should certainly be praying that for our church. In Romans 15, 13, he prays that God, that the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with power and hope of the Holy Spirit. Yes, please, let's be praying for that for us in this place. In 1 Corinthians 4, he thanks God for the Corinthians because of the grace given to them in Christ. He thanks God that they have been enriched in every way. So let us be thankful for what the Lord is doing in us, sanctifying us into his likeness and giving us knowledge and understanding in his wisdom. In 2 Corinthians 1, he prays for those who are suffering and he shares in those sufferings for the sake of obtaining patience and endurance. Let us likewise pray for those who are suffering, sharing it with them, helping them endure in patience. As the Lord matures us in faith, he puts us through times of trials. May we be faithful in praying for each other through those difficult times. Paul really prays for himself or his needs, or at least not in his published letters. Even this letter of Ephesians we're reading from was written from a prison cell in Rome. But there is one record of Paul praying for himself. It's recorded in 2 Corinthians 12, where it says in verse 7, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to keep me from exalting myself. So God sent Paul a thorn in the flesh and it was to keep him humble. It could well have been in the form of maybe a demon-possessed false apostle that was tearing up the church. In verse 8, he said, Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And the Lord said, No. God had a purpose for that thorn that plagued Paul and obviously Paul at the time didn't appreciate that otherwise he wouldn't have asked for it to be removed. But God told him that power was perfect in weakness so Paul was happy to be weak so that the power of God would be with him. Sometimes we suffer from uncertainty, pain, suffering, trials and times of deep sorrow. We shouldn't be too eager to ask God to remove every discomfort that we, can, we, we encounter. As soon as we get sick or experience some distress, our first response is to go to the Lord to ask him to take it away. But God has allowed us to be in that place. So our best response is to hang on tight and to trust him through it while at the same time pouring out our heart to him. Many Christians are being persecuted and tortured and killed today in many parts of the world, as Ben had shared with us last week. When you pray, be specific. Children often pray things like, bless mummy and daddy, bless my brother and my sister, bless my aunties and uncles, and particularly my grandparents. Oh, and bless the world. Now how is God supposed to answer vague prayers? In Mark 14, Jesus said, watch and pray. So when we pray, let us Pray with incessive attentiveness, with vigilance and alertness. Let us pray for specific things. We can pray positively for the things that God uh, is doing in us, that God would glorify himself in us. Let us pray defensively that we would not be given to temptation. Colossians chapter 4 is a good illustration of, the, illustration of this, where Paul says to, to the Colossians, Epaphras who is one of your number, a slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always labouring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in the will of God 
I bear him witness. He has a deep concern for you. Epaphras was a persevering person who kept his eyes open, who saw needs, and who prayed faithfully and consistently. So let's go back to our passage in Ephesians 6.18. With all prayer and petitions, pray at all times. Now, praying at all times has to do with frequency of prayer and involves us developing a God consciousness in everything we're involved in. To be so God conscious that you see and experience everything in reference to him. If we see or experience good things, we praise him for them. If we find ourselves sinning, we confess it immediately. If we experience or see tragedy, we cry out to him. We should see everything that way, absolutely everything. The good, the bad, the indifferent, the major, the minor, the big picture, the detail. David said that I have set the Lord always before me and everything in life is filtered through that God-enhanced vision. It's like putting on God-coloured glasses. Everything we see, we see through God's eyes. It's not just reading a list of prayer requests and praying through them, as important as that is. It's not like just having a prescribed prayer time in your own private place, although that's certainly part of it. It's much more than that. It's that every single thing you do in your life is something to talk to God about. When Paul says in Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer, he uses the word katerio, which means to be strong and constant. It's the same word used in Hebrews 11.27, which speaks of Moses enduring. The idea is to endure in prayer and to hang in there in your prayer. This is not a type of casual thing. It's, it's, it's a, like a strong, persevering and even struggling God consciousness. There are things that happen which we struggle to understand and we wonder why God allows certain things to happen <coughs> and why he allows struggle in the Christian life. But remember not to be anxious for anything, but in everything give by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving let your request be made known to God. Philippians 4.6 I would imagine you've heard many sermons that would exhort you to rise up early in the morning and spend time with the Lord in prayer. And this is another one. How can we develop a God consciousness throughout the day any better than by spending time in the Word and prayer first thing of each day? But your praying should not be limited to just the mornings. The psalmist said in Psalm 55, 17, Evening and morning and noon I will pray and in Luke 6, 12, Jesus said that he continued all night in prayer. In 1 Timothy 5, 5, Paul saying, Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. It is good to have a set aside time of the day to pray to the Lord. And I'd encourage you to do that. But having a heart in constant prayer is the message here. With all prayer and petition and at all times in the spirit, praying in the spirit. Prayers are us speaking to a loving God, our Father, and often in response to what we have learned from him and also sharing our heart with him. We do not have to go to the synagogue to pray. We don't have to have a certain posture. We don't have to pray at any particular time of the day or times of the day. We don't have to use prayer books, although they have their place. Matthew 6, 7 says, When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. I was interested during the week to look up uh, the Catholic tradition of praying the rosary, because I'd never really understood it, and I still don't. But their instructions go something like this. Make a sign of a cross and then say the Apostles' Creed. Say our Father. Then say three Hail Marys for faith, hope and charity. Say glory be. Announce the first mystery and then say the Our Father. Say ten Hail Marys while meditating on the mystery. Then say glory be. Oh, and optionally you can say, oh my Jesus prayer requested by Mary at Fatima. Announce the next mystery. Then say the Our Father and repeat those steps six through eight 
as you continue through the remaining mysteries. Say the closing prayers, which is the Holy Queen and the final prayer, and then make the sign of the cross. Many years ago, I had a client uh, who uh, basically recorded uh, meetings and published cassettes of those meetings for their clients. One such client was this new age woman. She uh, sold crystals, you know, crystals. And uh, she had this, uh, spoke with some authority about how to use crystals to uh, bring healing and peace and all sorts of things in your life. And the, um, the cassette was an instructional of how to use your crystal. You buy it with your crystal, right? So you get your crystal and it says, OK, the first thing you do is you get your crystal and you put it on your chest with your left hand while lying down and then you say to the crystal, crystal, turn on. I kid you not. And then you would give instructions to the crystal as, as she would instruct you, uh, things like, uh, you know, certain words to say to heal you for certain things. And then at the end of your, of, your, of your session, you would hold the crystal in your left hand on your chest and you would say, crystal, turn off. And you put it back in the box. Those people are going through regimes of prayer, formulas, to either a god of their own design or to a rock, none of which has any power to do anything. Only prayer to the one true God has any power to change a life. Soren Kierkegaard was quoted as saying that the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. Praying is the essential key, praying in the spirit is the essential key to powerful and effective prayer. To have God hear our prayers, he will honour it if our prayers are in accordance with his will. That means that if we know his will, then we'll know how to pray rightly. And it stands to reason then that we need to be living lives in accordance with his will. Many years ago, John MacArthur preached a sermon, or a few actually, on how to know the will of God. How do I know what I should do, where I should go, who I should marry? Um, and he listed off, or well, in different versions, certainly one version, uh, five S's that he said that you should have in your life so that then your mind is aligned with the Lord's and helps you to understand God's will for your life. Those five S's are to be saved, to be spirit-filled, to be sanctified, to be submissive, and to be suffering. Saved because you cannot be in God's will if you're not saved. God does not hear the prayers of the unsaved, of people who are in rebellion against him. John 9.31 says, We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. And even as Christians, if we have unrepentant un, uh, sin in our lives, the Lord may not listen to us. I can remember this happening a number of times when we, when we went through Isaiah, where God, where people, sorry, the people sinned against God and God chose not to hear them. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So, saved, then spirit-filled. I often hear people praying that God would send his Holy Spirit or fill me more with the Holy Spirit but you already have the Holy Spirit. On the day of your conversion, you receive the Holy Spirit in his fullness. You can't have any more. The Spirit doesn't come in doses. What is meant by being Spirit-filled is that the control of our life is less controlled by us and more controlled by the Spirit of God. We need to get out of the driver's seat and stop trying to make every decision based on our own wisdom and let God take control through his Spirit to direct us in our paths. I know a guy who has an issue with alcohol and when he's sober, he's quite friendly and easygoing. Nice guy, actually. But when he's had a few too many, he can become extremely aggressive, loud and occasionally even violent. You see, he's yielded control of himself to the spirits <laughs> or alcohol. But that's not really a great illustration here, I guess, because the more we yield our lives to the spirit of God, the more Christ-like we become. 
And reading God's words gives us knowledge and the Holy Spirit gives us understanding and wisdom. So saved, spirit-filled, sanctified. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, your life becomes more Christ-like as time passes. You should be able to recognise this transforming change in your life as the time goes by. Sanctification synergistic. While you can ask God for help in areas of your life, it requires self-discipline on your behalf. God's not going to do it all for you. Firstly, you need to be receiving teaching and then reading your scriptures. And you need to flee from temptation and to beat your body into submission. And while it's expected that we submit to God's commands and instructions, we're also expected to submit to earthly authorities. 1 Peter 2.13 says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God. By doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. God asks, asks us to obey the authorities above us so that people with malice will have nothing on us. You do know, don't you, that people want to criticise and bring down Christianity. They're always looking for some way to, to do that, to discredit Christians. And what is Christianity's poorest testimony? Well, it's often the Christians. Peter instructs us in 2 Peter, sorry, 1 Peter 2.18 uh, to be submissive to your masters with all respect not only to those who are good and gentle, but to those who are unreasonable. Many of us have had unreasonable bosses, and I know I've had my fair share of them. Yet we submit to them, not begrudgingly, but as to the Lord, as this will bring honour to him. So how should we, God respond when we are praying to him that you are dishonest when it comes to your taxes? doing cashies to avoid paying tax that you should or to you the way you resist instructions at work. So we are to give Caesar what he says and honour the authorities that God has placed above us. And finally, suffering. Being, to be knowing God's will, you need to be saved, you need to be spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive and now suffering. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.19, Therefore, those who, also, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to the faithful creator in doing what is right. Now, some people may say, but not me, um, oh, I suffer, I carry such a cross. My wife is my cross. And some women may say, well, my husband is my cross. And some husbands may say, my mother-in-law is my cross. But if we go back to 1 Peter 3.17, um, Paul is saying, for it's better if, if God should will it that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. If you can't get along with your wife, that's not the suffering he's talking about. That's a different issue. You may be suffering there because of your wrongdoing. You're probably not the kind of husband you ought to be. What he's talking about here is when you suffer for, for when you are doing what is right. When you live a godly life in an ungodly society, when you're going, to, you're going to take on some flack, that's what he's talking about. Christ suffered for our sake, and now we're being asked to take up our cross and follow him. So if we are saved and spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive and suffering, now we are starting to understand how to live a life that pleases God. And as a result, we are much wiser when it comes to the way we need to pray. We should start to understand the way he thinks and that we would think the same way. Praying in the spirit is to know God's will well enough that we ask him for things that would please him and ultimately glorify him. Praying prayers that are powerful and effective start with living a life that is in line with the will of God and asking him for the things that please him and are in harmony with his purposes. Now if you don't know you're in some distress and you're not sure how to pray and you're not sure what the will of God is, then the Holy Spirit 
who does know the will of God prays on your behalf. This is illustrated for us in Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So this has nothing to do with speaking in tongues and has nothing to do with ecstatic speech. The Holy Spirit is praying for us in perfect harmony with the Father's will. It may not be right to demand from God what makes us rich or for what heals us. That might not be God's will at this time and so it wouldn't be the Holy Spirit's will either. Some things are too difficult though for us to know for sure what God's will is when we're praying. We don't always know how to pray or what to pray for. So the Holy Spirit intervenes for us and prays on our behalf. Don't just pray once for something, but persevere in your prayers. Many people do not pray in a preserving way unless they're involved in some personal tragedy. Then they learn to pray per- with perseverance. But that's really a sign of selfishness on our part. We don't get passionate about the heart of God or of our brothers and sisters in Christ as much as we are about things that affect us. Praying for those things that should be of a concern to God should be the mark of a mature believer. We should be looking beyond ourselves and to God's kingdom and his purposes with an all-consuming devotion to prayer. How important are the things you pray for and how passionate are you about them? Do you entreat God in your prayers? A survey made by the National Retail Dry Goods Association in the US reveals the following results about their salesmen. 48% of the salesmen made one call to a new client and then quit. 25% made two calls and then called it a day. 15% would make three calls before they gave up. That shows that 88% of the salesmen quit after making one, two or three calls to a new client. But 12% kept on calling and they do 80% of the business. So persevere in your prayers to the Lord for his people and his purposes and for his glory. Powerful, effective prayer comes about when we persevere in all diligence with the Lord in our prayer life. Powerful, effective prayer comes when we pray for all the saints. I'm not just talking about Old Testament saints or the Catholic saints. I'm talking about the saints that are here and in other places. Those saints who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb and who have been redeemed through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The primary object of all our prayers is God. Everything we pray should ultimately be for his glory. And we do that by praying for each other. By praying for the sanctification of the saints, God is glorified. God is putting his power on display, his grace on display, his mercy on display, and God is putting his power on display. And he answers our prayers for each other. Healthy prayer is a prayer that is focused on things outside of us. We should all be praying at all times in all kinds of prayers and all varieties of prayers with all alertness and perseverance for all the saints. This is what the church is about. We should not be just thinking about our own issues, but those of the whole body. It's really not important what happens to us so long as our lives glorify God. When one part of our body is hurt, other parts tend to compensate for that. And so it is with the church. When one person is struggling, the rest of us can come alongside and minister to them with grace, mercy, healing and restoration. So let us endeavour to be praying for others and not just for our own concerns. (coughs) Ephesians 6.18 says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, to be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So let me encourage you to, be, to focus with all diligence on being in God's will, confessing your sin that you may pray effectively with the power from God for those around you. 
not just praying for their jobs and their health and other temporal things, but praying for God's will to be manifest in their lives. Praying like Paul did for their courage and endurance, for their joy and peace, for their victory over sin, that they may overflow in hope and joy. Bearing one another's burdens and sharing in their faith, let us do this as our servants service to God and for his glory. Just imagine how much better our sermons would be if we asked the Lord to help the preacher prepare and make us teachable each week. Imagine how much more we would gain from our grace groups if we were to invest in prayer for each other in preparation for our meetings each week. Can you see where we're going with this? Just imagine what our church would be like if we had 50 people joined together to pray for the service before the service on Sunday mornings. Let us dedicate ourselves to be prayer warriors for the sake of our church and for the glory of God. Let us pray. Lord, give us a new new zeal to be devoted to prayer with all diligence. We know that we can expect great things from you if we were only to ask in the spirit. May we be alert and not let the evil one bring disunity amongst us. May we persevere in our prayers for one another. We pray for each other this morning that we would love you more, that we would be strong and steadfast in the faith, that we would be bold in sharing of our faith. Give us wisdom and understanding of your word to live lives worthy of you. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.